Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Rurong Living, Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country? Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted award-winning coffee at gotyoursixcoffee.com. Welcome to this episode of the Get Up Nation podcast. Recently, I had the honor and privilege of speaking with David Kendrick. David is a combat veteran and founder of the mental health professional speaking company in Atlanta, Georgia called Lion Speaking Agency. In 2007, David was shot in both legs in an ambush while serving as a Cav Scout in the United States Army. He uses his experience to share powerful stories focused on mental health, suicide awareness, physical therapy and rehabilitation, opioid addiction, veterans issues, living with a disability, ADA law and workplace accommodations. As a member of the Source America Speakers Bureau, David travels the country advocating for individuals with disabilities to work on government contracts. David, it is my honor to welcome you here to the Get Up Nation show. Wow, that was good. (laughs) (laughs) David, first off, will you share where you currently live and work? I live in Atlanta, Georgia. All right. And when I am not speaking, I am a sales representative for Bank of America. All right. All right. You have so many experiences where you've exhibited resilience. I'm grateful you're taking the time today to share some of your journey with Get Up Nation. Today, I'd like to start with what led to your military service. Will you share, you know, when did you first have that interest in in potentially serving? You know what? It's, this is so ironic because I'm, I'm actually writing a book about my military service. And right. the way that I joined the military, I'm pretty sure is unlike any of the story that you've ever heard. Mm. I was just on the bus one day looking for a way out of my hometown. And I drove by a recruiter station and said, that's it. That's my fastest way out. I'm, I'm going to join the Army. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I walked into the recruiter station and it was 2005. And I was 17, and I just walked in and said, hey, guys, I want to join the Army. Wow. And the recruiters' jaws, they just all dropped. They're like, what? <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's never this easy. What's the catch? And I was like, no, man, I, I want to join. I said, as long as you, you let wh- – whatever I can do to leave Rochester as soon as I graduate high school. And I just wanted to come back with a story to tell. Mm-hmm. And they gave me all of that and more. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Certainly you do have a story to tell. You served as a Cav Scout and were deployed. How many deployments were you on? My military career was short, just one. One deployment from October 2006 to June 2007. We were deployed to Iraq. Baghdad, Iraq. Baghdad? Okay. Will you share a little bit about that day in 2007 where you were injured? Yeah, this is another ironic part of my story that I'm going to put into my, that I'm writing in my book right now. It was actually Father's Day. June 17th, 2007. And my roommate, he was a brand new father. He had had a, he had a baby. Him and his wife had a baby in January. And he came back. He, he went home to see the, uh, the baby born, came back. And I was like, happy Father's Day, man. Happy Father's Day. And uh, we were on what's called a disband of patrol, which a lot of Cav Scouts do, just walking everywhere throughout the city. And I was walking back to my truck, and I just heard a loud crack. And I started falling to the ground and then I passed out. And when I, when I woke up, I was on, I was laying face up on my back and I looked down at my left leg and it, it, it looked like something out of a horror movie. Like it couldn't even be attached to my leg anymore. All I seen was blood and my, my toes pointing in a way that I didn't think was humanly possible. So I thought to myself, okay, well, we're in some trouble, you know, and uh, I looked up and I looked to my left and I saw my truck commander. He was face down in the pool of his own blood. And we had a extra person called a dismount on my truck. His name was Michael Hamilton. He came and he told me, Kendrick, are you okay? What's going on? And I said, he said, yeah, you, just, you got shot. We were ambushed. 
And so what eventually happened, I ended up getting shot by a sniper in my left leg, kind of like the movie Full Metal Jacket. He used me as bait. Mm. And then there were two cars that drove up to the corner that we were on, and they got out the car with AK-47s. There were two guys, and they started to shoot at me while I was on the ground. Mm. And my truck commander, he came running over to me, and he jumped on top of me, and he was shot twice. Wow. He got shot once in, the, once in the arm and once in the hip, but he survived as well. Wow. And so I got shot in my femoral artery. So they cut my pants off right there in the middle of the street. And it's June 17th in, in Iraq. It's hot. My skin is burning on the ground. But yeah. they were eventually able to stop the bleeding. It took two tourniquets on my left leg, one tourniquet on my right to stop the bleeding. And thanks to that quick quick decision making there, you know, the combat lifesavers training that we had in, in well, leading up to the deployment, I'm here to tell that story today. Amazing. Amazing. It led to three years, 14 surgeries. Tell me about that process. You know, and, how did you get from the battlefield back to the States? I'm actually still having surgeries from the injuries. So the extent of my surgery or the extent of my injuries, the bullet had shattered my femur. It severed my femoral artery and it caused really severe nerve damage in my left leg. So when I was in Iraq, the, the terrorists, they had a tactic that they would use. They would dip bullets in feces and urine, and then they would use them. And so I got hit with one of those bullets, and I caught a really bad infection in my left leg. And they thought they were going to have to amputate, but luckily they didn't. However, since I was shot in my femoral artery and lost so much blood, I had to go through two blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. And in the deployment that we were on, we were extended from 12 months to 15 months. And President Bush, he initiated the troop surge where he sent, I believe it was 130,000 additional troops into Iraq. So we were getting hammered left and right. So the hospital in Germany actually ran out of American blood to give me because we were losing so many lives. So my second blood transfusion was with German blood. Mm. I think three or four days at Longstuhl in Germany, my trip from Iraq to America is, is really clouded because of so much surgery and I was black, blacking out. So I got to, got to Fort Carson. They didn't send me to Evans Army Community Hospital. I got sent to Evans Army Community Hospital. There they started my physical therapy right away. And they told me, if you don't start your physical therapy right away, you'll never be able to walk again. Wow. You have wow. to rebuild what you lost right away. So it took, I would say, about four surgeries just to repair my left femur. They had to put a titanium rod in my left femur, and then they had to repair my femoral artery. So they did a vein graft. So they took some of my veins from my, out of my right leg, and they repaired my artery in my left leg. And then they had to do, they were going to do something called an Achilles lengthening surgery, which I'm, I'm actually going to be getting this year. This year, 13 years after getting shot. Wow. But because I got, because I couldn't walk for three months, I had so much muscle atrophy that was built up in my left foot that now I, I don't walk with the limp, but it's, 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 it's a noticeable, different way of walking, I would say. So 13 years later, and I'm still recovering, still having surgery, and actually still going through physical therapy from that day back in 2007. Wow. And let's see, you were 20 years old when that happened. Is that right? Yes, I was 20 years old. And oh my God, I, I didn't, I forgot about that part of the story. I had just turned 20 years old in April. Wow. I deployed when I was 19 wow. and just, I just turned 20. I was only in the army for a little bit over a year at that point. And we, it was my first deployment and got, got injured. I'm 33 years old now, 13 years later. Luckily I'm still able to walk, but Still recovering, still recovering. So this, this began an odyssey of experiences and challenges. As you endured these experiences, will you share some of the challenges you faced? My first challenge was actually leaving the hospital. I was addicted to morphine and didn't even know it because I was, I was, I was hooked up to the, a constant IV of morphine and you can just click a button and it was like instant bliss. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of the hospital, I was actually trying to go back to the hospital to get more surgery. And the doctor said, you know, I think this guy's addicted. But 
because I was my injury was still so fresh, I was I still needed Vicodin, Percocet, and other painkillers. So it kind of it didn't give me that same fix that the morphine did, but it was a way to you know for me to get a fix. And I found out that there is a secret society in the military that that abuses medication. And I was put in a unit called the WTU at Fort Carson back in 2007. And everyone there was doing some type of medication. It became second nature to me. And that was that was one of my first challenges that I went through. Second challenges that I went through was alcohol abuse. My best friend was shot and killed by the same sniper June 18th of 2007. And he was my roommate at Fort Carson and in Iraq. So I had grown very close to this guy. And that hit me like a ton of bricks when he passed away because I couldn't do anything about it. And so when I found out, I was back in the States laying in the hospital bed. And when I found out, I wanted to do something. It was my best friend, but I couldn't. So uh, uh, apart from, well, in addition to being so young, being injured, Dealing with this opioid addiction, I, I used alcohol to numb myself from my own physical pain and then the emotional pain of losing my best friend. And I was on two blood thinners, one called Lovenox and one called Coumadin. And when doctors found out that I was drinking with these blood thinners, either they were alarmed because they said, you know, you can, you can cut yourself and bleed out. But at the time, I, I didn't care because I was in so much physical and emotional pain. That is amazing. So there are periods of homelessness, is my understanding. Yes. When I when I got out of the Army, I moved back home. I'm from Rochester, New York. And in 2010, benefits didn't kick in like I expected they would. My, I'm the only person in my family to ever join the military. So no one really knew what I needed as far as treatment or the right things to say or where to send me for help. And I got into a lot of fights with my dad. I moved back in with my dad and it, it was drinking myself to sleep every night. And me and my dad just, we weren't getting along. So I said, you know, it's best, it's best if I just leave. I had nowhere to go, just sleeping in my car every night. And it was just a horrible place to be in. I spent the entire summer of 2010 just drinking and getting high with my best friend and going to McDonald's and just just going down this downward spiral. I had a suicide attempt. I took a bunch of pills one night and swallowed them. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. Didn't care about anyone else around me. It was my way of trying to escape my reality. And when I woke up, I was in this padded room with my mom looking at me, asking me what was wrong. And it just broke my heart to see that I, even without committing suicide, I saw the impact of suicide in that room that day. And I saw, oh, I cannot do this to my mom. Wow. Wow. And then you did wind up losing another friend. And was that integral in you kind of having a rock bottom experience or making a change? Yeah. Or- yes. So in WTU, I became very close to a few guys there. We had a bunch of guys who were on a lot of different medications. And we would just all exchange them left and right. You give me this, I give you that. And we would all go out and drink with them. So on a Friday night, one of my good friends, we were going out and we didn't go to the same bar that night, but I ended up seeing him that Friday night. And he looked like he had already gotten into a fight. And I said, you know, I said what's, what's wrong with him? And they said, well, he fell off the curb face first. This was a Friday night. And the sad reality that we were living in is you see somebody who's drunk or pretty messed up all the time. You think, oh, they'll just sleep it off and be okay. Something in the back of my mind over the weekend said, well, go just go, just go check on him, make sure he's okay. But then I, I didn't because I said I've seen him worse than that. And Monday afternoon, I got a call that he was, he was dead. Wow. And we weren't, we weren't told the exact reason, but it could have been blood on the brain. It could have been from the fall. It could have been the combination of alcohol and drugs. It could have been alcohol poisoning. We don't, we don't know. But my reality check was when I was sent home to his funeral and his mother asked me, she said, well, you were the last ones with my son. Tell me what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, 
this, this, for these, for us to come, go through war and survive war and then come back and me thinking about committing suicide and my friend dying from being addicted to opioids and, and drugs, there has to be a better way. Amazing. So you got clean. Do you share a little bit about the change process of your thought patterns, your behavior patterns? Certainly, it's not easy to make those significant changes like that, just tremendous changes that you made. Will you share a little bit about, you know, seeing that look in your mother's eye, losing your friend, you know, looking at your life, you'd been through war. What started to change? Okay. So when I was at Evans Army Community Hospital, there was a general, two-star general who came in the room, and his name was Robert Mixon. And he was there as part of this tour because he was the general in charge of the base. He was showing people around. And once we told him where we were from, he said, uh, Rochester, you know, he said, I'm going to be retiring in Rochester. And if you need anything at all, please do not be afraid to look me up. And I thought to myself, okay, this is a general, two-star general talking to a little private way down here. He's just doing what he has to do. But when I got home, I was, I was looking for help desperately. So I contacted my local news station saying, hey, I just, I just need help. And they gave me his number. Oh, and wow. he remembered me immediately. Wow. And he got me enrolled into this program called the Warrior Salute Program. It's in, it's in Webster, New York. And what they do is help veterans who are suffering from PTSD, who, who just need help transitioning from military to civilian life. And so they bought me in and I moved into my own apartment from straight out of my car. And I was able to get a, a full-time job and learn how to budget, just learn the life skills that I didn't learn in the military. I and I learned that through this program. So I spent a year in this program just learning how to work, uh, civilian, learning about civilian jobs, learning about ADA, because with me being disabled, there was a lot of there was things that I couldn't do, but I was too afraid to tell an employer. It hurt. Right, right. So I, I learned that, hey, ADA is there to protect me because I ended up working at Kodak for a long time and wearing steel toe boots for 12 hours, standing the entire shift. And I, and I didn't know what my rights were as a person with disabilities. Wow. That had to be grueling with the amount of injuries that you had. I, I cried. Every night I came home, I cried because it was a temp. First, it was a temp job through a company called the Deco. And it was it was employment. And I thought to myself, well, I, I'm hurting so bad, but I can't tell anybody because I was afraid I would get fired. So I didn't even I didn't even tell people who I was interviewing with. I didn't tell the tip agency about my injuries because. I wanted to get my foot in the door. I needed to work. I was tired of sleeping in my car. And so I, I just didn't know what I, would, what I could do. But once I found out about ADA, then I said, okay, well, you guys need to make modifications for me. Yeah. Do you find that with other veterans? When we serve like that, we get really good at shutting off our own needs to sacrifice for the group. You know, we shut off our own needs and we're real skilled at doing that. And it's, it definitely is a different reality in the civilian world in asserting ourselves and saying, you know, instead of, you know, being ordered to do things, there's a totally different social environment. Do you find that too, that with veterans, we often don't get the benefits or assert ourselves in a healthy way to get some of the things that other people are more easily able to access? Do you find that? Yes. For me, it was pride because I was, I was 23 when I got out. Okay. And I had a hard time telling my story because there were times when I would park and use my handicap sticker and police would ask me, like, what are you doing? You look, you look just fine. Because I had, even though I went through this severe injury, I look just fine. Yeah. So for, it's, for a lot of veterans, it's pride. And then in, in the military, you're used to either demanding or being commanded. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, when you don't make the demands anymore, it, it's it's like, OK, well, I can't do this. Like I, And I've even been supervisors and managers in positions and people told me, well, you're too militant. I don't think, you know, that management style isn't going to work here and learn that management <laughs> in corporate America is more like a daycare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, it is definitely different. It is a definitely different situation when, when you start to make that transition. And also in the mental health stuff too, there's stigma associated with mental health. Mm-hmm. There is, you know, a lot of people who don't understand it, who fear it, who may even be experiencing it themselves. They may even know, you know, that they have a problem, but oftentimes won't reach out for help or will stay silent because they're scared or buying into that stigma. Well, and now you're doing amazing work, you know, speaking about this and mental health crises, suicide prevention. Will you go a little bit into what you do today and how you continue to serve? Okay. So I, I everything that I speak about is from my own personal experiences. Like when, when I seen the pain in my mom's eyes that day, that day in the, in the hospital, I just knew that, okay, well, for, for the mothers whose sons do commit suicide, it has to be a crushing blow to them. So I preach about suicide prevention and I, and I talk about it in my speeches. Just recently here in Georgia, I got certified in mental health first aid to help identify anyone who's going through any type of mental health emergency and, and intervene and provide just care and nurture them until the proper mental health professionals can get there. Kind of like CPR, but for mental health. You yeah. know, if you see someone having an emergency, you know, hey, in, intervene so they don't do anything to hurt themselves or others or end up going or going to jail or getting arrested or having any type of altercation with the police that ends badly for them. The suicide prevention, mental health, like I said earlier, ABA law so that no one just has to work and be in pain all day, every day. Yeah. And here in Atlanta, there's a lot of organizations that hire individuals with mental health disabilities those individuals with developmental disabilities. So I love to speak to them because when I was in Rochester, I worked for the Warrior Salute Program and I worked in a spice factory for CBS Unistel. And these were individuals, I was managing supervisor, I was a supervisor for individuals who were born with disabilities like autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. And they came to work with a smile on their face every day. Mm-hmm. every day mm-hmm. and to me i said okay well david what you went through was tough but look at look he was born like this or mm-hmm. she was born like this yeah. so it, gives, it, it gives me motivation and gives me things to speak about when it comes to mental health because they don't they were born with things like like different disabilities and i would, even though i was disabled halfway through my life they come in with a smile on their face every day mm-hmm. and wow. That's what I try to teach people or try to inspire people to do. No matter what you're going through, just smile through it. Mm. Yeah, let's talk about the speaking agency. You describe the Lion Speaking Agency as a representation of the power of having your voice heard. Like we were talking about people who are scared to ask for help or who are suffering in silence. How important is that for people to simply tell their story, to share their journey and be heard by somebody else? Yeah, I think with... The advancements in technology and especially social media, a lot more people are finding outlets in other people. Because I know when I was trying to tell this individual story when I was in Rochester, I felt like nobody was hearing me. I felt like a mouse, like a little, my voice was like a little squeak. And so I was at a program called the EBV program at Syracuse in 2012, and I was thinking of what to name this business. and. There are so many different causes out there that people just want to get out there and just scream. Like you get get a bunch of collective voices together and scream, like pay attention to this. And so that's why I named the the company Lion Speaking Agency. To bring attention to some of these things that may not be on the front page of the news, but are just as important. And what you see now on social media, people have, they know how to use their collective voices and get their message out. So what I love to do is teach people how to harness, harness their voice and get other people behind their cause and what they believe in and just bring some attention and some power behind their message. I want to ask you, especially with current events as they are, how can America do a better job of serving and supporting African-American veterans to ensure that they receive the respect and honor that they deserve for their service? I have a blog about that, being African-American, being a veteran. Yeah. It's, it's a fine line you walk because when you when you have the uniform on, thank you for your service and people want to buy you lunch and salute you. Right. But then as soon as I take it off, I'm just not the black guy, uh. you know, and then I'm subject to everything, all the 
stereotypes and the racism that I didn't get 20 minutes ago when I had my uniform on. Wow. So what I, what I try my best to do is teach people that it's more than just the uniform. It's the character of the person who wears the uniform. Right. Because not, not every soldier is a good soldier, just like not every cop is a good cop, but not every soldier is a good soldier either. And what I try to do is help people, even when they speak, build a character in their speeches. Build, build your character. Let people know who you are, what, what's important to you, what you care about, what, why did you join the military? I know I didn't join for a big patriotic reason, but what I got out of it I uh, spread all around the world, you know, and we have so many veterans who pass away from suicide. You know, that's what I got my message from. And in the African-American community, a lot of people ask me when I joined, well, why are you going to join the army? You know, we don't belong there. You don't, belong. but I'm able to do all the things that I'm able to do at 30 years old now that I wouldn't have been able to do, did, done in my life if I didn't join the army. Like I'm speaking to you now from my own house. Mm-hmm. I have a master's degree. I have a business. Awesome. I have a pretty good job. So what I try to do when I speak to other African-Americans is first get over stereotypes in our own demographic, in our own community. Because just like I said, in the Army, there's a secret society. And there are so many different layers to the African-American community. It's almost impossible to reach them all. But what I try to do is just educate as much as I can about you know, what I did in the military, yes, I got injured, but I wanted a story to tell. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't ask to be injured, but at the same time, I'm, I still am making the most out of my life. Mm-hmm. And you can do the same thing if you were to just try, just make something out of yourself. You have a profound story. I can't wait to read your book. Before we come to the end of the show, I was just wondering, could you share, I mean, you have the mental health first aid certification. You're a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness and American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. You have a ton of great skills, a ton of great insights, and truly are a portrait and example of resilience. If someone is listening to this right now and they're in a mental health crisis, what should they do right now? I have something called a team of champions, and I play a little game called Can I Call? Think about people who you can call who are going to tell you the right thing. Mm-hmm. Because we all have the friends who, if you call with an emergency, let's get high. Let's get drunk. Mm-hmm. Let's just waste some time. Or you just, need a, you just need to go talk to some girls. Think about who you can call who's going to be that person who's called you know, lame or the person who doesn't have a lot of followers on social media, but you know who will listen to you and give you that ear that you need in your moment of crisis. That's great advice. That's great advice. David, I am very grateful for your time today and your service that continues. What are some of the goals and objectives you currently have next for your business, for your life? How should those who want to partner with you contact you to make these goals a reality? I am on social media. On Facebook, you can find me, Lion Speaking Agency. You can follow me on uh, Twitter. At, my name is L S A L L C. Or my personal one is D at D Kendrick Jr. Or you can visit my website, www.dkendrickjr.com. Or you can just give me a call, 585-851-7454. And in the future, once this COVID is over, hopefully, fingers crossed, and we are able to speak in public again, I would like to speak for a lot of mental health organizations. I was starting up my own speaking event in person over the summer, but that got derailed. Because what I want to do is give those children a who who have a voice a live stage to speak on as well. Because mm-hmm. if you if you think about it, there's almost a a up and coming group or a a path that each person goes through for their profession, like comedians, athletes, music professionals, everything like that. But there's no real school for professional speaking. Hmm. So I'm, I'm think, I was planning on doing something like that over the summer. COVID kind of destroyed those plans. Hopefully we can kick it off in the fall. All right. Excellent. David, I was in the show with six quick questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. Will you run right. six quick questions with me? Let's do it. All right. Who are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for my little sisters. They they just keep me going and they kept me going when I was going through that deep, dark path. They were, they were kept me going. Awesome. And now that we've covered who you're thankful for today, what are you thankful for today? I'm thankful for 
the military. It gave me the drive and the motivation to separate myself and just be that army of one. <laughs> that was the slogan when I joined, just be that army of one. And how do you fuel the fire within you? Oh, man. I just keep on looking for new opportunities. It's never enough. Everything that I do is never enough. Even if I accomplish one thing, it's like, what's next? Kind of like that, that Kobe Bryant hunger. Just, yeah. you know, five rings isn't enough. I want six. I want seven. Nice. Awesome. All right. And what's one thing that adversity taught you to value? Oh, man. Adversity taught me to value my own grit and determination. This injury, no one could recover from this but me. And if I slacked one day just on any day of physical therapy, I wouldn't be able to walk, but here I am. What are you doing today? You may have never thought you could. This. <laughs> this, is my, this is my first podcast ever. My first awesome. time being a guest. You know, so that means that the business is working. I want to thank Randy for introducing me to you, but yeah. it means that the right people are getting their eyes on me and my message and that that lion that's, you know, within me is yeah. getting up there through the Get Up Nation podcast. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love it. Yeah, definitely. I can't wait to get this out to Get Up Nation and to continue to see what you do and the legacy that you create is just tremendous. And so that leads me to my final question. What will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? You know, the, the gyms are open and the weather is nice outside. So I would say do some sprints. We have a lot of parks out here where I live in Atlanta. So the, uh, there's a little baseball team that they're allowed to practice now. And so hopefully I'll be able to speak for them soon. And they want me to do some sprints with them tomorrow. So oh, that's I'll let you know how that goes if you invite me over again. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, see if you get some video of that. Like, that'd be awesome, <laughs> you know? All right, how can people learn more about you and your amazing work? They can visit me, www.dkendrickjr.com or send me a message on my Facebook page, Lion Speaking Agency.